concentrated in this experimental technique. It's called Mossbauer spectroscopy. I'm not sure if you are aware about this as spectroscopy, but it has one unique characteristic, and this is this is the most precise experimental technique we have. Hmm? And see, when I light up this laser upwards, the photons, you know, we have two interpretations of light, wave or particles. Hmm? If you think about particles, you have particles just moving upward. But we have a gravitational field facing downward. OK? When you light up like this, direction movement of photons and, and g, the gravitational field, is on the same direction. And the question is, is there any difference? Is there any difference if I light up or light down? So this by Einstein and the general theory of relativity. It says that light can be twisted by the gravitational field. Hmm? So, if I light up this way, the energy of the photons up is less than the energy of the photon down. Because photon down are pulled by the gravitational field. But the difference is so small, so small, that it took many, many years to find a way to prove this. Hmm? This statement was made uh, at the beginning of last century by Einstein. So equations of general relativity shows this. But also it shows how small the difference will be in the wavelength going up or going down until we had the most precise experimental technique to measure it. And this technique was Mossbauer spectroscopy. The guy who did this effect, Mossbauer effect, took his name. His name was Rudolf Mossbauer, German, young, PhD student in Munich. He was doing his PhD thesis, working with uh, uh, gamma ray. So to work with gamma ray at that time in Munich, he used the hospital facility, because in the hospital they have source of gamma ray. So he used to go there and work in, you know, using the gamma ray source in the hospital. And uh, one day, just by chance, he decided to uh, take the sample and the source of gamma ray and put them at low temperature. It was a problem about refrigeration in his experiment. And then he said, OK, I know how to solve my problem, at least for today. He took the sample and put inside liquid nitrogen. Refrigeration process there, technician problem. And unexpectedly, he found a new result. And the new result came to be a new effect. And right after he, uh, so his thesis turned to be 
about this new effect he discovered. And two years after he finished his PhD, he got the Nobel Prize. Probably the youngest Nobel Prize ever was to Rudolf Mosbauer. So, a few years later, uh, a famous in the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, invited Mosbauer to He moved there. He worked, at, he worked at Caltech for a few years. But then he moved back to uh, Munich in the tech city of Munich. It's nearby the city. It is a little bit far from the city center. I have been there as a visiting professor for three months, years ago. So, today I'm going to talk to you about, not only about the Mosbauer effect, but the spectroscopy. You can uh, use the Mosbauer effect effect to investigate material. So it's a very interesting technique. It is a little bit limited because most body spectroscopy these days, uh, there are three isotopes you can use it. One is iron. The other one is tin. And the third one is gold. But commercially, we are able to use only iron and tin. Gold, to make most you need to be nearby a big nuclear reactor. And that's not easy. These days, the only place they are doing uh, Mossbauer gold is in Budapest, the capital of Hungary. So there, a couple of friends, they work on uh, Mossbauer with gold, but very difficult experiment. Okay, so let's give a, you know, a short introduction about the Mossbauer effect first. And then we move to Mosbauer uh, spectroscopy. And Rudolf Mosbauer's wife, a few years ago, I think he passed away my, maybe less than five years ago. He used to be very often in the conferences, Mosbauer conference. We have three or four international Mosbauer conferences. And this technique was my first experimental technique. When I decide to take my master, I choose to work in the Mossbauer spectroscopy lab in my university. And one of the, one of the professors that installed Mossbauer spectroscopy in my institute, uh, he and his uh, wife, they are Indians. His wife is a sister of Professor Arvin. You know, the guy who organized this. So, and this Professor Gag, teacher in the undergraduate time, my third year of physics, he was my teacher. Okay, so let's go this. Let's talk about Mosbauer effect, a little bit about instrumentation, and then hyperfine interactions. And so, based on the hyperfine interactions, you can extract information. And then you can perform pamper the dependent experiments, you can perform angular dependent experiments field dependence experiments. But today, I'm going to talk about only, only about temperature dependent experiments. 
to perform field dependence experiments in most boy spectroscopy, which is very interesting, and help to solve very important problems you cannot solve. But then it requires you a uh, high field, and then you know liquid helium facility and all these things. I re only recently I managed to <laughs> to find some budget to buy the first Mossbauer uh, cryostat and install in our department institute in Brazil. It's going to be a system which uh, allows you to to split Mossbauer spectrum. And I will show you how, how important that will be. So, okay. And I will comment about some data modeling of the Mossbauer spectrum. So, Mossbauer spectroscopy. Today, the best, the most, the most precise instrument, Mossbauer spectroscopy, days, is located in Russia. Ekaterinburg. Hmm? So there is a maybe the third the third university in Russia is called Federal Euro University. And there is a group, Moscow group. They develop their own spectrometer. Very precise. That's the best. And so we work together in a Okay, here is the Mossbauer effect, and it is based on, uh, this was the effect that was predicted before, but it was discovered in 1958 by Rudolf Mossbauer. He discovered this in 1958, and he got the Nobel Prize in 1961. And when he discovered this, he was a PhD student, very young. So it is based on uh, emission and absorption of radiation, especially high energy, like gamma ray. Emission and absorption without recoil. So let's say the idea is very simple. If we have an atom, radioactive atom, and then that atom just make a nuclear transition and emit a gamma ray, this emission looks like a gun. When you trigger a gun, you know, and by observation of linear moment, the gun does this in your hand, right? A nucleus like that, exactly like this, okay? When a radioactive nucleus just emit a gamma ray, just recoil. This is basic physics. There is no way to prevent this, okay? The same way this hits the chest of one guy. Hmm? The guy just do this, right? It's also conservation of linear moment. So, the same way, when this nucleus emit a gun, it's another nucleus, that will also recoil. Okay. It means, if this nucleus emit a gun, because of transition in nuclear states, there is a difference in energy of this transition, right? When the gamma ray goes out, the energy of the gamma ray was supposed to be that difference in energy. But because the nucleus just recoil, the energy of that gamma ray is a little bit smaller. Right? Are you following me? OK. Then the question is, is it possible, is it possible that a gamma ray can go out from a nucleus in such a way that the energy is exactly the energy 
difference between the two levels? In principle, yes, smart enough to manage that the nucleus does not recoil. Okay. Again, is it possible the other nucleus that received the gamma ray receive the gamma ray and absorbs the whole energy in a transition without recoil itself? In principle, yes. So, this phenomenon calling recoilless nuclear resonance absorption, which means this nuclear emit without recoil, the other one absorbs without recoil. It is a resonance absorption, right? This phenomenon was this phenomenon was expected to occur. It was not it was never observed. The guy who observed this was Moss Bauer. By accident, he lowered the temperature of the source and the sample. What happened? If the sample and the source of gamma ray are at low temperature, okay, then uh, this recoil, the probability of this recoil is much lower. Why? Because in a solid, if it recoils, it means the atoms need to or generate phonons. And phonons when you lower the temperature, the density of phonons gets down very low. So by accident, Rudolf Mossbauer reduced the phonon density in the source and in the sample. He could observe for the first time this phenomenon, recoil less uh, in gamma ray. Boom. He discovered something new. I mean, he proved some expectation. And his thesis became, you know, a very important PhD thesis. It is like this. This is the probability of coilless. Huh? It goes exponentially with the average of vibration of the atom uh, emitting the ray, the radiation, or absorbing the radiation. Okay? So you see that the higher the amplitude of vibration, the lower the probability of recoilless. What Rudolf Mosbauer did was he lowered the temperature and then he reduced a lot this factor. This is the of this location of the atom who is emitting or the atom who is absorbing by accident. And I can tell you, accident, it happened in the lab. The best work I did in my postdoc when I was working in Bell Labs in the US was totally by accident. Hmm? It was one day weekend, they announce they will not provide water in the pipe for refrigeration of the lasers. It was summertime, very hot outside. The place I live had no air conditioning. I used to stay in the lab till late at night. And then weekend without lasers, I cannot go to the lab. I should stay in the place I live where the, the lady that rent me did allow me to install the air conditioning. The old Italian lady, she said, old air conditioning in my house. I lived here for 80 years. And then you come, you Brazilian come and tell me you need air conditioning? Are you kidding me? So I could not install my air Then I had to stay in the lab. But doing what? I had no laser. I was doing optical spectroscopy. Need lasers. High power lasers. I was so boring. I said, no, 
I'm going to work with this little helium nail laser. Those little ones, less than one milliwatt. Less, maybe half milliwatt. The one was five watts laser. Hmm? Krypton and argon ion lasers, five watts. And I had just one guy, a little guy, half milliwatt. I said, okay, I have my sample inside the cryostat. It is at helium temperature. Let me try to see something. Boom. I discovered something new. That happens just by accident. It happens very often. And then it happens also with most power. The difference was he won the Nobel Prize, I won nothing. <laughs> so the idea was here is the emission spectrum. And here is the absorption spectrum. So that is related to the atom who is emitting the gamma ray. And this is related to the atom which is absorbing the gamma ray. OK? OK, that is the energy of recoil energy. In principle, this curve will be here, and that curve will be there. They matching each other perfectly. But the one who is emitting just shifting energy, because part of the energy was taken by the atom to recoil, OK? So the emission and the absorption are taking apart. They don't share. They don't overlap because of recoil. What he did, he froze them both. And they don't shift much anymore. So they shift in an amount that they still have an overlap enough to observe this effect, enough to prove this effect, this phenomenon. And that was his discovery. So then he could develop his thesis and explore this phenomenon and find out how it works and optimize this phenomenon. And what comes first was a new spectroscopy. And the first, the most, is the spectroscopy that you use iron 57. Because iron 57 has a nuclear transition which is very much suitable to perform most voice spectroscopy. Maybe more than 95% of all Mossbauer related works in the world have been performed with iron 57. The rest of it maybe is tin and a very small fraction with gold. Okay. Then this is a typical corner of a Mossbauer in Yekaterinburg in Russia. So that one time, I visited there many times, I took this picture. So you have all the instrument, instrumentation here that controls the Mossbauer spectrometer. But basically, the Mossbauer spectrometer is very simple. Look, here is how it works. You have your gamma ray source, OK? Now, you take that gamma ray and attach the gamma ray at the tip of this stick. This stick is connected to this driver. This driver just moves like this. See the speed of my finger? It's like that. Maximum 10 to 12 millimeters per second in speed. You touch your finger there, you can see. Move like that. How about the amplitude? Maybe like this, the amplitude. OK? Like this. Huh? So the radioactive source is just glue there. OK? It's a very thin foil, metallic, round. Huh? 
glue at the tip of this guy and it moves like that and your sample is here huh? here is the driver doing like this and the sample is here the sample could be inside a cryostat okay hmm? so like this detector is over here okay so the sample the radioactive atom is in a solid matrix which makes that when when the atom emits the gamma ray it does recoil much because the mass the system mass now is not only the atom mass because the atom is in a crystal structure the mass is the whole mass of your sample it makes the recoil very small the same way the absorbing atom is not in a liquid, is in a crystal. When it absorbs the gamma ray, the recoil is not only the recoil of one atom, it's the recoil of the whole crystal, which makes also very small. If you lower the temperature here, it makes it even slower, okay? Because to absorb the gamma ray and recoil, it has to emit phonons, okay? But if the temperature is low, it doesn't emit phonon. The probability is very small. Okay, now you put your sample over there and behind is the detector and see, this is what happened. This is the nuclear transition that takes place in the radioactive source, okay? So the nuclear, the nucleus just take this transition from excited states to ground state and then emit a gamma ray. This gamma ray, see, it has a little bit of spreading. This spreading in energy is because of small fraction of recoil, but not enough to split the two apart, okay? Then, again, in the absorber, the nucleus just make the same transition. Remember, the nucleus here is the same nucleus there. Iron here and iron there. How do they make this in practice? Like this. for iron. It is like this. There is one radioactive atom, cobalt, 60. It is cobalt 60, not carbon 60, not fullerene. Okay. This atom Cobalt-60 is radioactive, okay? It has a transformation or transmutation to iron-57. This iron-57 is created with nuclear spin-7.5. Unstable. Then, it has a transition to five and a half and a transition to three and a half. Still excited state. And then it goes down to half. This is the transition which is used in that one. So actually here at the tip of the source, you have this isotope. This is the isotope you buy every year because the half-life of this guy is about one year. You buy it typically with 50 milli kihi in radioactivity. In one year, one year it will be 25. Next year, 
So every year, if you are managing a most power lab, every year you buy, you better buy a new SERS. And well, it costs about 5,000 US dollars, one sample. Hmm? It's a small guy like this, huh? <laughs> Maybe three milligrams or three to five milligrams only. Okay, now here is the, actually this guy here is the transducer. That's the guy, okay? The guy is inside here, the transducer is inside here. The sample is over there in front. And this is the whole electronics to make this driver moving precisely. And also to collect the data coming from behind the detector, okay? So that's the way it works. And then you have a spectrum like this. This is a typical most of our spectrum. And you see that the peak position is just a dip. Why? Why it is a dip? Hmm? Because look at the position where the detector is. The detector is over there, behind the sample. If the sample does not absorb anything, the intensity of the radiation goes straight there, so the intensity here is the same intensity here. Maybe a little bit less, because of scattering. But if your sample absorbs something, what happens? The intensity behind drops down. And that is the guy, okay? So, when, when this guy here when this stick moves like this, 10 millimeters per second only, <coughs> when it moves this way, the energy of the gamma ray is the typical energy of the transition plus the speed. <laughs> Very small, right? How much energy one millimeter per second can give to a high energy gamma ray when it moves this way? It increases a little bit. When the driver moves backwards, it decreases a little bit, okay? So, but this is so small and so precise that it was able to measure this one. That is the reason, okay? So, what was the experiment they did? They took the same guy, like this one, mm, and make it pointing upwards, vibrating this way, and measure the difference in energy of the gamma ray going up and down. They made it, easily. Okay, and here you can see, maybe this is liquid nitrogen over there. This system is in Russia, I told you, this, this is the best, the most precise system we have in the world, because they made a change. All the systems in, in the world, they work like this. The sample is the one you put inside the cryostat. The Russian guy, you know, Russians are crazy. What they did, they took the sample out of the cryostat and put this guy inside the cryostat. Now, this source is the one which is at low temperature. Mm, that makes, oh, of course, you know, sample. They put everything inside the cryostat. The sample and the driving. So it's a crazy idea, but they, they made it. The trouble is you can work with liquid nitrogen. You can handle that. But liquid helium, forget it. <laughs> you cannot put all these guys inside liquid helium. You cannot hold this unless you have a, a huge tank of liquid helium. Mm? 10,000 liters, maybe. But nobody's going to afford this, right? Okay. So this is the, the way the spectrometer, and this is a typical Mossbauer spectrum. Very simple. 
one transition only, one level, one transition between the excited states and ground states. See, all these are nuclear transition. They are not electron transition, okay? This technique is a nuclear technique. Okay, let's see. Next. So, only a few, only a few isotopes are candidates for Moss Bauer uh, source and absorbers. Only a few. But as I told you, the one is correct for this is iron. Iron is the guy. So it starts with the cobalt. Oh, cobalt 57, not cobalt 60. And then this is the radioactive source. It decays to iron 57 and then goes down in a cascade. This is, this is the transition we use for the most power spectroscopy, 14.4 keV. That's the energy of the gamma ray. So that's the most power transition over here. OK. Then you can measure, using most power spectroscopy, you can measure three parameters. Hmm? Three. The one we call isomer shift the one we call quadrupole splitting, and the hyperfine field. Hyperfine field is exactly the internal field that Pierre Weiss was talking about. Hmm? This is, this spectroscopy, it measures internal field. Exactly the one that came from the Pierre Weiss explanation of magnet. So that's the one you can measure with most boy spectroscopy. And therefore, see, the internal field scales with the magnetization exactly the way Pierre Weiss wrote. I mean, internal field is linearly related to magnetization. He wrote like this, internal field is equals to constant here times magnetization. And most boy spectroscopy measures exactly the internal field. So you have a way to understand the magnetism directly from most boy spectroscopy. You measure directly magnetization. Okay? Now, let's learn a little bit more uh, about those four parameters, isomer shift, quadrupole splitting, internal field, you know already what that means. But what means isomer sh shift? It means, think like this. Uh, we can write an equation that describes isomer shift. But I can maybe make some extra comment on this slide. So, the most bar spectroscopy is based on two atoms. The one which is in the source and the one which is in the absorber. This absorber is your sample. Okay? Now, uh, let's say that in, in the source, you have this transition here, okay? In the absorber, you have the same atom, the same atom. But let's say the excited state in the nucleus is not exactly on the same position. It might be shift a little bit up or a little bit down. Why? Because the, this atom here is in a solid, and this atom is in a different solid. OK? Here is actually iron 57. 
metallic. And this atom here is, let's say, iron 57 in magamite. OK? Different environment. So the nuclear level of iron 57, because iron is linked to oxygen atoms, it is different. Iron here is linked to iron, but here iron is binding to oxygen, which means the energy levels of iron atom, hmm? the atomic orbital of this iron atom, are not the same as the atomic orbitals of this iron atom because of the uh, chemical binding of this guy. Though this chemical binding between iron and oxygen, hmm? iron and oxygen, how do they bind? This guy wants to bind because it has 3D energy levels. And this guy wants to bind because it has 2P energy levels. Right? Hmm? Electrons that make the chemical bonding between oxygen and, and iron in this compound, electrons came from 3D from iron and 2P from oxygen. OK? And here is different. Here is 3D with 3D, metallic binding. Here is different. Okay, now what happened is when this chemical binding is set, this orbital just changes a little bit. When it changes a little bit, it changes the whole atom. It changes not the 3D, it changes the 2P, 2S, and 1S. Everyone is changing. So, if you look at density distribution, electron density distribution of all orbitals, the 1s orbital, 1s, 2s, 3s, is a spherical, right? Now, it means electron on those orbitals, they visit the nucleus. They have a finite probability to enter the nucleus. Hmm? You know this? If you look at pi, the pi orbitals, huh? or p orbitals, look at, you know these pictures, I guess. Hmm? This is s orbital, right? This is p orbital. Is it? Do you remember this? It means, here's the nucleus. The probability of electron p to be in the nucleus is 0. OK? This is d x, y, orbital. What is the probability of the electron in d orbital to be in the nucleus? Zero. But what is the probability of an s electron to be in the nucleus? High. Not zero. So it means when this guy binds here, it changes everyone, including the s. If the s changes, it changes this nuclear level. Hmm? It changes the nuclear level because of the interaction between the S electron inside the nucleus. So it may happen this shift a little bit up or a little bit down. OK? This much of shift is the isomer, isomer shift. 
It's simple, right? You measure directly how much the nuclear level shifts up or down because of change on the S orbital's density. Simple like this, OK? It means if your source and sample is exactly the same, that spectrum, oh, this guy here will take place exactly at zero velocity exactly zero velocity but if that shift goes up in energy goes up okay then this one shifts to positive velocity because it needs a little bit more energy if the zoma shift is down then this transition takes place at lower negative velocity huh? That's what happened. This is the moss bowie spectroscopy. You can measure this. OK. That's the isomer shift. But besides isomer shift, we have quadrupole splitting, too. Huh? That's the second one. Wow. What is the quadrupole splitting? It's something like this. You know, nucleus. Uh, they are not exactly spherical. They are prolate or oblate. Okay? They are elongated or squeezed this way. Hmm? All nucleus which spin is half is spherical. But if this nuclear spin is not half, then it is elongated or obladed, okay? So, and then let's say the nucleus is just elongated, okay? Then there are atoms linking around to the atom that that nucleus belongs to. So those ions linking around, they create a gradient of electric field. Hmm? So crystal structure around a gradient of electric field. Hmm? As long as these ions around are shifted from cubic symmetry. If there is cubic symmetry, then the gradient of electric field is zero. There is no field. Identical ions in a cubic structure provides you zero gradient of electric field in the middle, where the nucleus R is. So if there is any change on the charge around the nucleus, if that shifts from cubic symmetry, then you create a gradient of electric field. Okay. Now, if the nucleus is not spherical, there is an interaction between the charge distribution of the nucleus and the gradient of, magnetic, of that electric field. This interaction is called quadrupole splitting. Hmm? And the quadrupole splitting means that one nuclear level can split Let's say, if the, nuclear, if the nuclear number is half, it is spherical. There is nothing. But if that is three and half, hmm? nuclear spin is three and half. What happens if that nucleus is placed on a site in a crystal which is not cubic? So. The nuclear spin with spin three and a half place in a crystal where there is a gradient of electric field, this level splits into two, half 
and three half. That's quadrupole splitting is exactly this one. This is quadrupole splitting. So it is a very precise way to measure whether the crystal structure around the nucleus is cubic or not, and how much it shifts from the cubic symmetry. Hmm? Very important data, very important to know whether the uh, nuclear environment is cubic or not cubic, and how much is it out from the cubic symmetry. Quadrupole splitting measure this precisely, directly. And finally, there is the hyperfine field. Okay, so hyperfine field, it means that if the nucleus is in a matrix which is magnetic, the magnetic moment of the nucleus just interact with the magnetization of your sample. And then opens up even more the energy levels. That's called Zeeman splitting, okay? So you can understand the magnetization of this one. Finally, if your sample has only isomer shift, your spectrum just move from the center of zero. If it has only quadrupole splitting, well, instead of one line in the middle, you have two lines. Huh? Two lines. One from the three half to the fundamental state, and one to one half to the fundamental state. So you have two transitions. Two lines. And the center of those two lines is exactly zero velocity. If you have both isomer shift plus quadrupole splitting, you have two lines, but the center is shift from the zero. It could shift negatively, or it could shift positively. Hmm? It is positively if this happens. Shift upwards. If it's negative, shift downward. And if there is magnetism in your sample, <laughs> The spectrum splits even more because then you have here uh, plus three half plus one half minus three half minus one half and here you have plus one half minus one half and they're all all possible transitions all allowed transitions between these levels so you have more lines. How many? Six. Six lines. So transitions from the states which is splitting because of the magnetic field on this one. You have four levels here. If you have applied magnetic field, four, four levels. Plus three and a half, plus one and a half, minus one and a half, minus three and a half. Here you have two. Minus, min, min, uh, plus half and minus half. And all transitions between them. Six, six allowed transitions, okay? This is the most power spectroscopy. And we can see, I was a little bit afraid, but see, here you can see the isomer shift. The difference is, I wrote, I, I draw mine with this guy having no shift. They draw here with a little shift, see? Okay, I don't mind. Mine is even simpler. And they draw the other one with two shifts. I draw just one shift. Hmm? But the idea is the same. Concept is absolutely the same. OK, and then here is the quadrupole splitting. Look what I draw. Here is the quadrupole splitting. The source has no quadrupole splitting, but the sample has the quadrupole splitting. And then you have a transition between the 3 half and half and one half and a half. Two lines. Look at that. And the hyperfine, you know, the internal field, if there is magnetism in your sample, 
this level is split in two. This level is split in four. And you have six allowed transition. Your spectrum will, will show six lines. Beside the six lines, the six lines, the center should be, could be exactly at zero. If there is no isomership, if there is no quadrupolar splitting. But if all these things come combined, this guy just move. Okay, move around. Okay. Now, all Mosbauer spectra you can see in the literature. You only will see Mosbauer spectra looking like this guy this one or this one. Six lines are combination of six lines. Okay? Two lines are combination of two lines. One line or combination because you may have in a sample two phases. One phase giving you one line, the other phase give you one another line. Then your spectrum will show two lines, right? But from two phases different. The same way you can see in your spectrum, most boys spectrum, you can see 18 lines, a combination of three hyperfine spectrum. Okay? So you have to understand this and then analyze your spectrum correctly. Okay. And here is, you know, a more explanation of what I have been talking. So that's the isomer shift. See, here's the source, that's the absorber. Okay, the transition in the absorber is much higher in energy than the source. That's why the isomer shift is positive here. Hmm? The driver needs to give energy. Huh? Velocity is positive. Oh, here is the way here is the equation for isomer shift. <laughs> okay? How you calculate isomer shift? It is the difference in the density of S electrons in the absorber and in the source in the center of the nucleus. This is a position in the nucleus. That's difference in the density of electrons between absorber and source. Hmm? So this difference is the isomer shift. Of course, you have some constants here. Look at that. Huh? Typical constants. And here is the quadrupolar splitting. You can see two lines. Besides the quadrupolar splitting, two lines, we still have this isomer shift here. See? That's the isomer shift. So it's a combination of isomer shift like this, and quadrupolar splitting. What I was trying to tell you, this is the nucleus, which is not spherical, elongated, okay? So, and then this nucleus is turning in an environment where there is a gradient of electric field. And then there is an interaction between the gradient of electric field, see? This is the gradient of electric field, Z component of the gradient. And this is the quadrupole of the nucleus. Quadrupole moment of the nucleus. Okay, so the product, the, you know, the, the convolution of these two functions give you the quadrupole splitting. And this is what we call asymmetry parameter. It is, it is, it measures how much your environment shifts from cubic symmetry, actually. If you see the way they define, it's the gradient of electric field in the x direction, ma minus the gradient of electric field in the y direction, over the gradient in the z direction. So that's the way, that's the quadrupolar splitting. So the two, two important parameters here which is isomer shift and quadrupolar splitting, you can calculate them. A lot of people 
not these days, but you know, in the 70s and 80s, it was a very, you know, it, 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 it was a strong activity in mass bar spectroscopy, not only experimentally, but also people calculating this. They were calculating all these things. I mentioned to you uh, the Indian professor who is in Brazil and start there uh, most by spectroscopy or help start most by spectroscopy and who was my teacher in undergraduate. He is an expert in calculating quadrupolar splitting, specifically this. Okay, now, so as I mentioned before, maybe 95 or even more than 95% of most power spectroscopy data and papers is based on iron. Because it is easy, easy to fabricate the source for iron, cobalt 57. You can fabricate it in a nuclear reactor but it is easy to fabricate. And because the lifetime is long, like one year, okay, you can commercialize it, no problem. But some, some isotopes, the lifetime is just a few hours. Like gold, is a few hours. How can you buy a source? Hmm? 10,000 from your place, Buy a source there and then use in your lab. When it gets your lab, it is nothing. It is already dead. Huh? The iron, iron is long, one year. You know? Half life is one year. It's enough to commercialize and do everything. That's the longest lifetime for most of our isotopes. Okay, now you can see here. A summary, this is velocity in millimeter per second. And then you can see here is mm, one, two, three. This is the range of uh, quadrupole splitting here and isomer shift over there. So it's not very much. Here is minus 0.5 plus, oh no, here is one. 1.5, so the range is very small. This is why the driver goes between 10, plus 10, and minus 10. No more than this. No need more than this, okay? So it's a very small velocity, actually. Okay? Uh, and here it shows how those two parameters, they change with the temperature. They do. If you look at uh, isomer shift over here, as you increase the temperature, isomer shift goes higher. Not very much. You can see the difference here is not very big. This is 1.50, uh, let me see. This is just, oh, 148, 1.48, 1.56, 1.64. It's opposite. Okay, it shifts in this range. Very small shift, not much. In a big shift in temperature, actually. Okay? Likewise, the quadrupole splitting, you can see 0 0.9, 0 0.1 in a wide range. It, does, it doesn't shift too much. So the internal field, we know how it shifts with the temperature. So internal field is magnetization, okay? So magnetization, it shifts with the temperature. You can track the phase transition. So magnetization comes from high to zero. Okay, the internal field goes exactly like that. Let me show you. Oh, okay, let's go here. See, this is a typical most boy spectrum, a real one. And then you can see here, uh, we have two irons, iron two and iron three. This is why 
we have this coupling uh, of two two quadrupole splitting. So this is actually two bubble spectrum, just superposing one another. Okay, and then and roughly so this is at room temperature. This is a lower temperature. It doesn't shift too much. But you can measure precisely how much it shifts. This is the point. Though it doesn't shift too much. But a small shift is a very important information. Now, this is just, again, the sketch. This is a typical most power spectrum magnet transitions. You can see all the six allowed transitions here. And then, OK. Here is a, a, a a real work. Uh, so what we did here, we just, I think I, I showed this, this before to you this morning, susceptibility. Now I'm going to show you the same, but most power. OK, that's the most power spectrum. So thin oxide is not magnetic, right? And then we dope with iron, iron. But I show you this morning that we explore the susceptibility, showing that this system is not at the higher doping content, but at lower doping content. It is essentially paramagnetic. There is no magnetism on it. So that's why you have a most voice spectrum like this one. Huh? There is no six lines which means your sample is not magnetic. Not magnetic, order it. It is paramagnetic. So paramagnetism is typical of a double line. Hmm? <coughs> so quadrupole splitting is typical. And then you can see from 300K to 4K, well, it's not a big shift. But you can see, the, if you measure it precisely, you can see the Zomer shift goes from 0.3 at room temperature down to 0.37. You may say, well, it's nothing. But I can tell you, it's a big. <laughs> because small shift gives you a lot of information, actually. And same way, look at that. Quadrupole splitting comes from 0.8 to 0.75. Again, you may argue to me, well, it's nothing. It is, it is a lot. It gives a lot of information. Okay, so we can extract information from this. Let's move to the next one. Oh, okay. Now, here is a very recent paper, actually, this year, I guess. 2017, yeah, okay. Now, what we did here, we synthesized this magnetite, and we coat magnetite with two kind of shells. This silicon molecule, which has amino group here, and the difference is between this shell and this shell. This has amino, and this don't have the amino terminated here. Okay, so one is amino terminated, the other one is no amino terminated. What is the difference? The difference is that the amino group when you coat. Magnetite, the amino group, binds to iron sites more effectively than this one. So this one just binds, binds the surface of magnetite using this oxygen. But this oxygen is not very much available. Hmm? There is a stereo hindering that oxygen can comes and bind to the surface. It's not very effective. So it makes a difference in the interaction. So it changes, it changes the surface of the nanoparticle. It changes the iron atom, especially at the shell. OK? And then you can check this using Mosfor spectroscopy. These are real. Mosfor spectroscopy. And you can see here, hmm, though the final spectrum can show you only six lines, but we were able, we need to analyze this using 
three components actually three three components clearly one component comes from the ions which are at the surface at the layer another component comes from iron in a site magnetite as any other cubic ferrite they have two kinds of sites for iron a site or b site a site is tetrahedron b site is octahedron and then they are different not only in magnitudes but they are different in gradient of magnet or electric field so quadrupole splitting is different and magnetic interaction is different so three three components here responds for this for the shell and for the core and the core for a and b sites because the shell is different in one sample and in another sample the spectra you can fit here this the, the three lines the, of the three spectra are different in one sample and another sample and it is different at room temperature and low temperature see here is room temperature you can see that we fit one quadrupole splitting and six lines so it changes from low to high temperature it's a very precise technique there are many information behind this data in this table we can collect all the isomer shift quadrupole splitting all this for all components okay so let's see what is next oh what is this oh oh this is interesting too in this in this work what we did we use the tin oxide and dope the tin oxide with all these four ions and see what happens at the end we found that what happened is this is simulation so in the pure tin oxide supercell which is like this one this is the pure one okay but when you dope actually the doping they make some holes some vacancies here huh? they include some vacancies here see this one was removed this guy that one is a vacancy that takes because they removed this guy so we can map we can map how much vacancies we have in the sample and then we can simulate all these parameters like uh, isomer shift and quadrupole splitting and then we can check this using Mosbori spectroscopy so this is a work that combines experimental data and calculation and this is a calculation of course and so here you can see this is the most boy spectrum not from iron but from tin tin is the second isotope i told you not so often as iron but also very important so we can check you know the isomer shift the calculation so see this line is the calculation and those are experimental points we check not only isomer shift but also quadrupole splitting and make comparison with the experimental data so this is very important to make this comparison because you can calculate isomer shift and you can calculate quadrupole splitting okay now this is a well this is a work from from years ago but you can see that the magnetization it scales with the hyperfine field or internal field and how you measure in a most boy spectrum how you measure the internal field internal field is this distance here between the external lines you have six lines six you take the distance between the external ones that your internal spectrometer you take internal field in units of millimeters per second but you have a calibration 
and then you transform the limits per second in kilohertz. Okay, so you have this scale. Easily you can extract the magnetization. <clears throat> so this is a typical most power spectrum of magnetic nanoparticle. Okay, so if your nanoparticle is magnetic, it has this kind of relaxation spectrum. This is a sort of relaxation spectrum because normal, normal spectra of magnetic samples is like this. See? This is low temperature, very magnetic. And this is high temperature, super paramagnetic. Okay? That's the difference. So this, this spectrum here, actually, it is a little ugly, noisy. But this is a very nice super paramagnetic spectrum, this one. Very nice, OK? Not so noisy, very well defined. It looks like a quadrupole splitting in the medium. OK. This is a typical example. This is very low. This is low temperature, and this is high temperature. Also, if you change the size, see? Bigger size comes like this. The particle is not in the super paramagnetic state. But if you shrink in the particle, it becomes super paramagnetic. If that becomes super paramagnetic, the spectrum looks like this. And then you have to fit in with many components. Here you can see many components to fit the real spectrum. It's typical in this spectroscopy. You use many components to fit your data. Very typical. And today it is easy because there are software, good, good commercial software you can run in your laptop. <coughs> hmm? You can fit your spectrum in your laptop in less than one minute. Okay. When I was doing my master thesis, oh, <laughs> you know how I did? I was using most by spectroscopy. I had to fit the same guys. They didn't change. The spectrum is the same. OK. We had at the university one IBM 1130. You don't know what this is. The room where they installed this computer was maybe four times this one. The hard disk was this big. And it requires, you know, pull it up and move it around. So how was the memory? Hmm? Five megabytes. Five megabytes was huge. Huge. Five megabytes. How much memory is this? <laughs> 256 gigabytes. OK, now, how long it takes to fit my Mossboy spectra? I have to leave early, late in the night, because my job requires whole night, six hours, five hours processing. And then I used to drop it there late at night, like you know, between 10 PM and 12 p.m., and then go back next morning to collect the data. And you know how it was? Maybe you never, <laughs> you never saw this, because the job and the data came in the cards. Did you know this? Do you know this? We wrote program, and then we have to punch cards. All data were in cards, paper cards. You know, the box we carry with the program and the data was a box like this, OK? And uh, you know, 500 or 1,000 cards, OK? And then we carry that very carefully, because if you step and, and fall down, the cards will be spread on the floor. 
it's going to take you one month to put them together again, right? So <laughs> it was terrible. One spectrum per night only. And next day you look at the fitting and say, no, it's not good. Huh? <laughs> I need one more night. Terrible. Okay. It was hard. <laughs> but it was the way. No other way. Everywhere in the world was the same. Okay. Uh, now, again, you, you can see typical most boy spectrum. It was very useful to investigate passivation of nanoparticles. So when you synthesize nanoparticles, you have to passivate the surface. Otherwise, if you leave them in solution, maybe two days later you come back, there is nothing there. They all disappear. <laughs> because you know, they are very unstable. You have to passivate the surface, otherwise it just, you know, goes away. Huh? Dissolve again. And then we use most power spectroscopy to investigate the process of passivation in the surface. Very interesting data, very interesting result. We published this in Langmuir. It a very, it's a highly cited paper. Very interesting. So, oh, again, here let me me show you a difference. How different a external applied field is. <laughs> Look at that. See, this is a typical spectrum of magnetite. Six lines, but remember, magnetite you have A site and B site. A site gives you six lines. B site gives you all six lines, but both six lines are so close together <laughs> that you cannot distinguish unless you apply an external field. See the difference here? Look, particularly these two lines. Look at that. This line here. Look, it splits. Hmm? And then you can investigate the population in of iron in A site and B site. And this is very important information. Because depending on the population of iron and A sites, the magnetism of your sample will be different. So the explanation of magnetism in samples like cubic ferrite has to do with the population of A and B sites. And this is the best technique to solve this problem. But you have to make investment in magnetic field. Only 1.6 1, 1 Tesla was enough to make a little bit of splitting. So we are waiting in the lab in Brazil one cryostar 8 Tesla. Wow, that's a dream. So the two spectrum will be shipped like that. Huh? And then you can fit. And then you can calculate uh, the uh, population of A and B sites precisely. And you can make, you know, comparison with some other spectroscopy, like Raman spectroscopy. I'm going to talk about Raman, not the guy. You better talk about the guy for me. I'm going to talk about Raman spectroscopy. And there is a very good combination of Raman spectroscopy and Mossbauer spectroscopy in looking at the population of different sites like A and B in cubic ferrite. OK. Oh, so here I can show you that this is the internal field, right? And the internal field scale with the magnetization and then with this curve. The typical phase transition description. So it goes like that. This is a typical phase transition. Actually, this data here, this data is from my master. It's a paper published in 1982. I use, I use Mossboy spectroscopy to extract this 
transition, phase transition process act. And oh, I cross half an hour almost. Thank you so much for your patience. And if you have any questions. Hmm? Okay. How this is different with, uh, with the nuclear magnetic resonance uh, spectroscopy? Magnetic resonance? Yeah, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Oh, what is the difference between yeah. the two? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Actually, they are quite different. The, qu the question is, what is the difference between Mossboy spectroscopy and nuclear magnetic resonance, right? Oh, they are so different. First, this one. It has to do with emission of a gamma ray that comes from a nuclear transition. Okay? Nuclear transition between two levels of nuclear states. Right? So that's a direct transition between nuclear states. And what about magnet? resonance, nuclear magnet resonance, like the simplest one is proton. Okay. The proton has two levels in the nuclear. Okay. So, like water. This guy here. Okay. It has nuclear If you bring water in a magnetic field, these two states just splits, right? So you look at the transition between these two levels, OK? That's transition between these two levels. But here, the, this is not a gamma ray. <laughs> so the energy is extremely smallest than the nuclear gamma, than the gamma ray. Okay? And also, see, here you have the nuclear and you have this spin. Okay? So this guy is processing like this. It's a magnetic moment. Okay? So it is the frequency of precession of this nuclear spin is the frequency of precession of nuclear spin. Okay? It is not a transition between a one upper level to a down level. No, it's a transition between the two states from the same principal nuclear number. Okay? okay? Not okay. like the most power spectroscopy. The most power spectroscopy comes from a higher energy level and has nothing to do with the precession of the nuclear spin. It has to do with the transition between levels. Uh, means that uh, both the spectroscopy are uh, talking about the perfect energy resolution. Both the spectroscopies are talking about the most uh, perfect energy resolution? No, I think it is not only related to resolution. No, it's the principle of the resonance itself. One resonance, it has to do with transition between upper nuclear levels and lower nuclear levels. Mm -hmm. This one has to do with the precession of the nuclear spin. So, this is in the megahertz. Very small energy, okay? So it's a, it's a big difference between one system and another one. Thank you, sir. Though both, you can say, both are nuclear techniques, but completely different ones. OK. I see you tomorrow morning. OK? Thank you. Thank you. Take care.